Well, thank you all very much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be part of this panel and to see my former colleagues, Dan and Michael, who I haven't seen in 20 years at least. Uh, so it's great to be uh, back with them again. Um, I'll just make a few points uh, in response to, to what they've said. And the first point I want to make is that asylum law ought to be viewed in the context of our immigration system. I think all of us on this panel understand um, that asylum law is part of our immigration system and has to be considered in that light. Um, if the overall policy of our immigration system in the 21st century is to limit immigration to the United States with asylum as an exception, um, that exception has to be viewed in the context of the overall uh, policy. Uh, to my mind, asylum is not and should not be viewed, uh, as some of my colleagues uh, think, uh, as a freestanding human rights law, uh, unrelated to and separate from uh, U.S. immigration law and policy. Um, it is part of our immigration system. As my colleague David Martin uh, at the University of Virginia Law School uh, has said, one of the few immigration law professors has actually worked for the government, um, Asylum is a precious commodity uh, that we ought to hold in reserve for the people who really need protection. Uh, and uh, if we get careless uh, in that, um, public support for asylum will and should diminish. Uh, and we actually see that phenomenon occurring all over the world now. Asylum is not a phenomenon limited to the United States, but it's under uh, pressure and demand uh, all over the world. Uh, and I think it's losing political support as a result. And we run the risk, uh, if we open the asylum window too wide, that it may not in the future be available for the people that we all agree uh, need uh, protection. Uh, and, and so we ought to be on guard um, uh, with that concern. I want to say something about the credible fear standard uh, because uh, I was at the INS at a time when uh, the credible fear standard was fabricated out of thin air uh, to deal with the phenomenon that large numbers of people were headed for the United States in boats uh, and we needed a way to process them quickly. Uh, and uh, as a short-term device that we thought would help us process them and, and help us repatriate uh, and turn around the people who clearly did not have a case uh, to come to the United States, the credible fear standard was created as an administrative measure to help turn around the obvious cases of ineligibility. Uh, that's what it was invented for. Uh, and it, it is uh, startling to me to see it in the statute of the United States now. Uh, I have no doubt that the members of Congress that put it in the statute intended that it be used in the same way, as a way to turn around people uh, at our borders and at our airports who clearly did not have a case. Uh, and I think no one intended it to be used the way it's being used now, as an affirmative way to get into the United States even though you don't have a valid asylum claim that you can come in and say, well, you know, I don't have a valid asylum claim, but I can meet the credible fear standard, right? I can put together a good story uh, and then get in affirmatively. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think anyone intended that use for the credible fear standard. I think the credible fear standard had a, a use at its time. I think uh, it's outlived its usefulness in part because it's so easily gamed. Uh, people can come up with stories that they know are going to work. Uh, and so I think we need to reconsider uh, whether the credible fear standard has outlived its usefulness, whether it causes actually more harm uh, to our system uh, than benefit. Um, and uh, as, as Dan mentioned, I gave testimony to the um, House Judiciary Committee in December in which, you know, I'm an academic, so we're, we have the luxury of looking at the big picture while I applaud many of the proposals Dan has raised in his paper. Uh, you know, the bigger concern is to me, has the asylum standard outlived its usefulness? We only had asylum in the United States since 1980. Um, how did we fulfill our international obligations uh, to protection before 1980? Oh, well, we had withholding of deportation prior to 1980, and we still have it uh, in the form of withholding of removal now. Um, what is it, 241b3? Uh, and um, that's, that's still on the books. Um, 
I think asylum was a good idea in 1980. Um, but I don't think anyone envisioned uh, the current situ situation that we're facing uh, with the enormous numbers of uh, people claiming asylum, uh, the way that uh, asylum, like credible fear, has been gamed uh, and people have fabricated stories uh, that they think will work uh, and thanks to the internet are easily spread and, and, and propagated. Uh, so I think uh, we need to think about um, whether the whole notion of asylum, which is under attack worldwide, I would, as I said earlier, uh, not a phenomenon uh, limited to the United States, whether that has outlived its usefulness, and if so, what alternatives are there? Well, we still have withholding of removal on the books, and uh, people say, well, that's not as good as asylum. It doesn't provide following to join for family members. It doesn't provide um, uh, adjustment of status. Well, you know what? We could add those. We could improve with withholding of removal by adding following to join for family members. We could add um, adjustment of status under, under specified conditions to, to that. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I like Dan's idea of uh, adding a conditional period, a conditional green card. Uh, we, we give a conditional green card to spouses of U.S. citizens. Right? We give a conditional green card to investors uh, in the United States where we say, we're not going to give you a green card right off the bat. We're going to give you a conditional green card for a couple of years, see how you do, and, uh, and, and we'll make it permanent at the end of a, a certain period. Well, if we're going to do that for spouses of U.S. citizens, um, why wouldn't we do that for asylees? Uh, to say, yeah, you know, you can you can adjust status after a certain interval of time, but uh, we're going to make your green card conditional, just like we do for spouses of U.S. citizens, uh, and then uh, you know we'll give you a permanent green card a little further down the line uh, than we do now. But I think I think the the whole notion of switching from Section 208 asylum to Section 241b3 uh, is something that that we ought to consider. I think the Supreme Court has made clear uh, that there's a higher threshold for withholding of removal than there is for asylum, and I think that would, without a doubt, um, limit uh, incidents of uh, fraud and questionable uh, asylum claims. Um, just uh, two more points that I'll, I'll close with. Um, we often hear uh, about the importance of border security, and, and I don't think anyone doubts the importance of border security, but I think we have to be under no illusion uh, that border security uh, is by itself a solution for all the challenges our immigration system faces. Uh, you know, people tend to say, oh, you know, to whatever immigration reform proposal they said, and we'll strengthen the border, right? That'll fix all the problems going into the future. Well, I, I just want to say, no, it won't. Um, border security by itself cannot fix our immigration system. And the reason everyone talks about border security is because there's no constituency opposed to border security, right? Any other area of immigration law, you're proposing change, someone's going to fight you on it. But on border security, yeah, no one's really opposed to more border security, even the, even at the spend of tons of money. But the reality is border security isn't going to solve the problem as long as the demand for immigration uh, so dramatically exceeds our willingness to take legal immigrants into the United States. Uh, and so if we really want to limit immigration to the United States, we need to deter the demand. We have to alter the cost-benefit analysis uh, that people go to when they try to come to the United States in violation of our laws. One of my colleagues at Temple used to say, the poor people of the world may be poor, but they are not stupid. They are as capable of doing cost-benefit analysis to determine their own self-interest as anyone in this room, and they do it all the time. And, and you know, if, if people are doing a cost-benefit analysis to decide uh, whether to come to the United States in violation of our laws, I say, well, what are, the, what are the benefits? Well, if you get in, you know, you have a lot better life. But if you, uh, you also run costs. You might get caught. It's expensive. You have to pay smugglers. Uh, it's dangerous. Uh, and so they engage in that process. And if, if, if we want more illegal immigration, we, we increase the benefits and lower the costs. You'll get more. Uh, if you want less illegal immigration, you have to lower the benefits and increase the costs. You'll get less. Uh, and, and I think we need to recognize that if we're looking at a long-term fix on our immigration system, we have to alter that cost-benefit analysis. And, um, uh, you know, fundamentally, if we're 
trying to go to the most basic question in immigration law, it comes down to a binary choice. Do we want to limit immigration to the United States or not? That's a yes or no question. Either we're willing to say unlimited immigration to the United States is fine, or unlimited immigration to the United States is not fine. And we, we have to have some sort of numerical limitation that we're willing to take. Um, and we're willing to turn away people who look like our own ancestors uh, simply because we have a numerical limitation. Um, take your choice, right, one or the other. And I think uh, our dilemma in the United States over immigration is based on our inability to make that basic choice. Um, and in effect, too many people uh, including many in government are saying, give me a third choice, right? I don't like either of those choices. I don't like uh, having unlimited immigration, and I don't like having to enforce a limit either. Give me a third choice. Well, I think there isn't a third choice, right? That's, that's the big secret, uh, and, and we have to make that hard choice, and that's part of our problem. You know, this situation at the border, some of us, uh, last point I'll make is that uh, some of us remember that famous 60 Minutes report uh, at Kennedy Airport, which was made in the early 1990s. It showed people were just walking into the United States after landing without documents at the airport. Uh, and I think we need, I don't know if any of you are from CBS News, but we need 60 Minutes to go out and do a, do a report uh, at our southern border showing what's happening there, that people are coming in, making a credible fear claim, and uh, walking into the United States uh, without documents, uh, without any assurance that they're going to show up for their hearing. Uh, I think that would be uh, as sensational uh, a report uh, as the 60 Minutes piece was uh, 20 years ago. Thank you very much.